Seeing as I've finally awoken from the coma the Game of Thrones finale sent me into, let's talk about how what could have been the best show ever ended with a flaccid, uninspiring chode of a finale. Now the way these videos usually work is something happens in the episode and I'll make some kind of snide comment or stupid meme that devalues the hard work of hundreds of passionate people. However, even though this episode goes for a year and a half, only three things happen. Tyrion revolts, Jon does the thing, and the gang establishes the New World Order. So I'm very glad to announce that I've decided not to make a video on episode 6. I can't contain myself! Grey Worm teleports and the giant lizard understands feudalistic symbology. Let's tear this thing to shreds! The Iron Throne opens on nothing happening. Tyrion proudly examines the aftermath of Danny spitting the dummy. The citizens of King's Landing have been liberated from Cersei's invisible tyranny. The plot has been liberated from the malicious grasp of logical consequences. And this guy has been liberated from his skin. Tyrion wanders off to find out if Jaime successfully liberated himself from his character arc. Worm Momo executes a number of conscripted soldiers who surrendered and are now prisoners. He does this because they chose to fight for Cersei, who is evil, and we are not evil. You should think that Grey Worm, of all people, would understand being forced to fight without a choice, especially when the whole point of this is that Danny liberates people from feudal servitude the same way she liberated people from slavery. But on the other hand, you shouldn't think because this is season 8 and that kind of behaviour has been outlawed. Jon and Wormo have a staring contest, which is great setup for the epic final duel of Game of Thrones between the two of them oh well. Jon leaves to talk with Danny because he's never really cared about honour and justice or that sort of thing. Tyrion takes a tour of the new family mausoleum and discovers a pile containing approximately eight bricks and his siblings' corpses. He cries in dismay that had they only stood three feet further to the left, they would have lived. Here's the rubble falling in episode five, and here's the rubble fallen in episode six. Did Kyburn posthumously teleport hundreds of tons of brick? Where did it all go? I hope this is explored in a sequel series. <laughs> Smurf the beetles! Smurf them! Go, 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 go. <laughs> Aya is... wait, what? Aya? Didn't she ride away at the end of the bells? Usually when you leave a place, you end up in a different place, but Aya is of course a non-Euclidean interdimensional space warlock, why not? So she can both leave and not leave King's Landing at the same time. I guess Kyburn is working overtime beyond the grave because he's also gone and teleported Aya's horse to Narth, which is where all the underdeveloped and forgotten plots go. Ahem! Speak of the devil! Grey Worm appears at the top of this staircase, which was definitely there the whole time, even though Jon started going here before him and he was busy committing war crimes, so you might think that Kyburn teleported him too, but that's actually a red herring to set up a very clever subversion of your expectations. Because really what's happened is that Grey Worm simply took the jetpack off of Theon's corpse before Sansa burnt him. Keep up, nerds. Danny congratulates everyone for the thing that she did all on her own in the most on-the-nose fascistic comparison since General Hux. Look, Kathleen, we can do it too. I've never been too big a fan of Amelia's delivery in the fake languages, but credit where it's due, her delivery here is a lot better than it has been. But since fucking when could the Dothraki understand High Valyrian, or are they cheering just because they have nothing better to do? Having seen the tremendous turnout for her first concert, Danny announces that she's taking the show on a world tour. Aya appears and looks cross at Danny for... I'm not sure what, for killing those innocents? For stealing the Cersei kill? For messing up her hair? It's almost as though Aya has no place in this scene as she has been completely separate from the Daenerys story the whole time, but she's here anyway because the writers couldn't think of a way to get rid of her, which is fucked because what was the point of the fucking horse at the end of the bells? Screenwriting is so hard, guys. Oh my god. Tyrion hands in his letter of resignation, but as he doesn't give his two weeks notice, his employer is legally permitted to imprison him. Mandated, actually. Kyburn's ghost teleports Aya to join Jon, who says what we've all been thinking for the past three seasons. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? Jon wants to resolve things peacefully, but Aya reminds him that Danny knows he's a secret Targaryen, which is cool because we actually didn't know that Aya knew that. I'm gonna know a killer when I see one. Oh, gee, are you fucking sure about that one? Daenerys, a killer? How do you figure? So Jon goes to have a chat with Tyrion and the Unsullied take his weapons. This will be important later. Tyrion laments ratting out Varys because... Why did he do that exactly? Loyalty? Then why tell Varys about Aegon in the first- Ah, oh, fuck it. Tyrion says, John, you're alive after death. Is there life after death? And John, who is currently alive after having died, is like, Tano, probably not, hey! John acknowledges that the bells was fucked up, but puts it behind him because at least the show is finally ending now. Tyrion warns him that they're developing spin-off series, which pushes John to eventually kill the executive producer. She liberated the people of Slaver's Bay. Did Danny never tell anybody else that she renamed it the Bay of Dragons? Or 
or were they just hoping we all forgot about that? Tyrion says Danny's nature is fire and blood, and John finally addresses that he's a Targaryen. Nothing comes of it though. After saying he won't make excuses for Danny, John rattles off a bunch of excuses for Danny. I can't justify what happened. Hey, she left her no choice. The mo I can't justify. She saw her friend beheaded. Justify. She saw her dragon shot out of the sky. And she Danny kind of forgot about. The Iron Fleet. I can't justify what happened. John realizes that he isn't Hitler, so yeah, maybe it would have been better if he was in charge. When she crucified hundreds of Miranis nobles, who could argue they were evil men? Has anyone in the writing room watched Game of Thrones? This is nonsense. They weren't all evil men. People did argue, and it was a huge plot point. What the fuck? Is Tyrion's ability to know things tied to his ability to drink? Like, if he stops drinking, does he stop knowing things? I love her too. Am I supposed to believe this? Does anyone believe this? But I believed in her with all my heart. Then why did you tell Varys the thing about jo Tyrion uses Jamie as an example of love outweighing reason which prompts John to quote my favourite line from the whole series. Love is the death of duty. Tyrion's like, what the fuck, bro? You can't say good dialogue in season 8, but John says, nah, mate, it's all good. It's a season 1 quote. And we don't even get acknowledgement that Aemon was John's great granduncle. Like, instead of. Mr. Aemon said it a long time ago. Why not just say old family saying or something cute like that? Even more annoying is at the end, we don't even get to hear. It's a Targaryen alone in the world. It's a terrible thing. Anyway, Tyrion butchers the quote. Duty is the death of love. No, 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 you mustn't have heard it right. It's the other way around. Love is the death of duty. Yeah, that's it. Death is the duty of love. What? Duty is the love of death. That's not death is the death of death. One more time. Love is more powerful than reason. Duty is the death of love. Even though Tyrion is completely right, Jon still doesn't want to kill his girlfriend, because he's a beta. To him, loyalty outweighs justice, which is an interesting departure from his father's values and his own previously held values. However, Tyrion plays his trump card, the same card Varys played against Ned to convince him to do something against his honour, the family card. So love outweighs loyalty? That's certainly changed since Igret, and I'm not sure why. Is it because Jon loves Danny so much more than he loved Igret, but love for Sansa and Arya outweighs love for Danny? That's new too, because just this season, Jon was fine siding with Danny over Sansa, but then again, he did go against Danny to tell his sisters the truth of his parentage, so I have no fucking clue what's going on. Jon has been all over the place. This scene was a total mess. That's it. I'm getting grumpy now. So Jon goes to have a chat with Danny, and the Unsullied let him walk past with all his weapons. Talking to Tyrion, who we're going to execute anyway. No weapons! No weapons! Talking to Danny, who you seemed pretty grumpy about after chatting with the guy who was vocally opposed to her. Right this way, sir. Sharpen your blade. In fact, have mine. You can never have too many knives. Drogon seems to know what's about to happen, but it's a Sunday and he's off the clock, so he's gonna let it slide. Gollum finally gets a hold of the ring. <laughs> You can tell something huge is about to happen because the throne's theme is played in F minor instead of C minor. I imagined a mountain of swords too high to climb. Hey, remember this thing from the books we didn't do? Fuck you! Also, bitch, no you did not. You saw how big the throne was in your undying vision, you fucking liar. Danny blames Cersei for her burninating all the people. So I could use the same logic to blame Dave and Dan for me pissing and shitting all over the place. Jon begs Danny to use mercy the way it was actually intended instead of as an excuse for destroying the world. World. Did you forget our anniversary? Again. Yes, I was too busy destroying the world. Danny says the scariest shit you could imagine. Because I know what is good. What about everyone else? All the other people who think they know what's good. They don't get to choose. <laughs> She asks Jon to help her burn the world and build a new one from the ashes, and Jon does the thing. Wait, so what was it that pushed him to do this? Was it Tyrion bringing up his sister's safety? Then why go into this scene trying to change Danny's mind if yours is already made? Or was it this terrifying self-righteous revelation he just witnessed? Then what was this about? Or was it just because she was using too much tongue? Wait, he used this piddly little dagger? Are you fucking serious? He had long claw. What the hell? I understand the impracticality of drawing a longsword while macking. Truly, I do more than most. But isn't Azor Ahai supposed to no scope Nissa Nissa with his epic magical bane of evil sword? Fuck. Drogon gets off his ass to give his mum's corpse a good sniff, as you do. It is incredible how much emotion the dragon team gets out of this thing. The display drags on a bit too long before he pulls the gotcha on us. You stand accused of treason. How do you answer these charges? Lord Baelish. 
Drogon burninates the throne instead of Jon because... I don't fucking know. It'd be neat for several reasons if Danny's soul walked into Drogon, but knowing this show, I doubt that's the case. So I guess we have to accept that the dragon decides to burn the symbol of power and supposed tyranny that he's never seen before instead of the guy who obviously just killed his mother. The stupidest part of this is that afterwards, the concepts the Iron Throne represents aren't even abolished. So what was the fucking point of any of this? Drogon gets confused by the plot and decides to fly to a different show. Maybe somebody knows how to embalm over there. Wait, you're not gonna let him take his dagger back? Dick move. Oh, that sword cost Weeks later, Grey Worm continues to assert his dominance over his men by never wearing a helmet. That ought to show him. He escorts Tyrion to the Dragon Pit to do a council, and not Jon presumably because he killed Jon the moment he had the chance, of course. So at the council we have Tyrion, who represents the West, I guess, even though the greatest power he ever held there was his Casterly Rock's Poopsmith. Grey Worm, whose forces have assumed control of King's Landing. Samuel Tarly, a disinherited Night's Watch Oathbreaker and Citadel Deserter who represents the Reach? Maybe? This this guy, who I've just decided is Howland Reed. Ed Muir Tully, Lord of Riverrun, and maybe the Trident 2? Probably. He represents the Riverlands and Season 3. Aya Stark, who represents anime protagonists and not much else. Bran Stark, who represents Bran Stark. Sansa Stark, who represents the North. Brienne of- Hang the fuck on! All of you are here? I distinctly recall being told that- There must always be a Stark in Winterfell. I guess that's my fault for having paid attention. Ugh. Like, why is Aya even here if they brought an army as well. Moving on. Brienne of Tarth, who represents all the victims of the Great Amnesia outbreak of 305 AC. Dave, who wasn't invited but he followed us and we were too polite to ask him to leave. Gendry Baratheon, who represents the Stormlands. This guy, whose name might be Jeff, representing that place you've never heard of. This guy, who rides for Gondor. And this guy, who- oh wait, that's Yara. This Oberyn cosplayer. Robin Aaron, who represents the power of calcium. Jon Royce, who represents the Vale even though he hasn't been there in three years. And this guy who I think just might be the Prince of Dawn. Christ, with a lineup like this, why didn't you invite Bronn too? Or shit, why not throw Hot Pie or Kinvara in there for a laugh? Could you imagine a scene this important in the books or even earlier in the show where there are this many people present that we've never even fucking heard of? Grey Worm tells us that Jon is imprisoned and not dead, which is weird. So these prisoners of war from earlier deserved immediate death, but the man who murdered your queen in cold blood must be held captive awaiting due process from an outside council. This is not the Grey Worm we know. Also, lol, there's no evidence John did it, you maniac. Yara, who is still in this show, turns out, says she swore to follow Danny, which is not at all what happened, but okay. She advocates for letting the Unsullied kill John, which they should have already done, and I figure out why Aya is here. To say a badass line. Say another word about killing my brother and I'll cut your throat. Fuck yeah, mmm, what a little badass, you show her, yeah, mmm, you go, I, mmm. Dave interrupts what was sure to be a catfight for the ages to say the funniest thing ever. If there is land in the reach, make it your own, start your own house. <laughs> I don't even think this is a joke about Davos being out of touch because nobody gives him a look as if to say, ah, bro, they're eunuchs. In fact, nobody addresses it at all. What a shit show. Do I not hear to speak? Then why did you bring him? I'm so confused. Tyrion reckons this will be easier to sort out if we put someone in charge, and Big E has an idea. I'll gather up my past and make some sense at last. Ladies. I never the I suppose this is the most important moment of our lives. We we'll decide today to reverberate the annals of this just as one of the senior lords in the veteran of two wars. I like to think my experience has led to some small skill. Understand. Please sit. Let him finish! Sansa, get off my fucking list and please forget you were ever on it. This is no way to talk to your peers, let alone your elders, let alone your own family. You think you're the only one who suffered through these wars? Edmure Tully was imprisoned for over four years. He spent one night with his wife before your brother's ineptitude ripped away the one thing that had made him smile since his father's tragic death. He didn't meet his son until the boy was four years old. He has been tossed around like a bag of meat simply because he refused to fight evil with evil. In Edmure's darkest moments, he 
stood for what his father raised him to believe in. Family, duty, honor. Meanwhile, you're gallivanting around, leaving a lone wolf to die without the pack and leaving Winterfell starkless. And you have the audacity to command him to sit. Is he a bit of a doofus? Sure, maybe. Honestly, you don't know him well enough to make that call. But even if he is, doesn't the man at least deserve to speak his mind and make his case? Hasn't he earned that? What else do you need him to go through? Fuck you, Sansa Stark. Fuck you. Anyway, Sam invents democracy, but that gets respectfully shot down because, of course... You don't vote for kings? Tyrion says he defo shouldn't be king, and yeah, right, Pharaoh, but bro, who else? There's literally nobody else we could choose. Nobody here has a very good reason to be king. Oh no! If only there was someone currently present who has a legitimate claim and would act as a compromise candidate. Poo! But Tyrion, the smartest man in the entire world... No! It's our universe! No! It's our <laughs> who has had nothing to do for weeks but consider this very thing has a really good answer. There's nothing in the world more powerful than a good story. Look, I agree with this notion and it's very gurmy, but the conclusion drawn from it is just insane. And who has a better story than Bran the Broken? Mate, fucking six people in this meeting have a better story than Wheelie Bran, no offense. Tizza goes on a spiel anyway about how cool Bran is. Did Bran coach him to say this stuff? Is this what their convo in episode 2 was about? Anyway, Santa's like he doesn't want that shit and his dick doesn't work, which was kind of up in the air before, but I guess Santa is in the know on that one for some reason. Tyrion says that ending dynastic primogenitor to succession is what Danny wanted, which ain't it, chief. The elective system Tyrion proposes is more of a wheel than the pre-existing system ever was, and the only new freedoms granted are for the people of the highest class to choose which of them gets to boss the others around for the next 20 to 30 years on average. And really, it'll just evolve back to regular dynastic succession in a generation or two anyway, because dumbass Tyrion gives Bronn the reach, and therefore all the food, and therefore for control of a voting block that will continue to elect his house in perpetuity. So congratulations, you fucking morons. You just put the future of Westeros in the hands of whatever little cunts this cunt happens to shit out. And I, for one, welcome our new insect overlords. Why do you think I came all this way? All this way? What do you mean? Winterfell is only six minutes from King's Landing by jetpack. Everyone agrees that Bran should be king, including Howland, not Oberyn, Jeff, who I can only assume is from House Goldblum, the new Prince of Dawn, and Skeletor. What? Gendry too, because the amnesia plague spares no soul. Sansa doesn't want the North ruled by Bronze Brood in the future, so opts for independence. This is freely granted, so naturally both Yara and the Prince of Dawn take the opportunity to- Oh, they're just gonna stay, alright. Did anyone else think Bran was gonna stand up too? Anyway, the new monarch makes Tyrion his hand as punishment for being such an awful hand to other monarchs. Brilliant. Wormo's not chuffed though, so they compromise to send John to the watch as well. Grey Worm has accepted the justice of a life sentence. This. This is the most unbelievable thing I've heard from Game of Thrones. What the actual fuck? Who is this pansy ass, helmet loathing fuckboy, and what has he done with Torgo Nudo? Where is his passion, his vengeance, his burning desire for blood? All this man knows is war. What little he knew of love was ripped from him, and here he kills over and lets the man who ended the dream of a new world leave with his head. Where is the trial by combat, is what I'm fucking asking. Anyway, John doesn't give much of a shit about the future and is stuck dwelling on the past, which figures. John is just as surprised as I am that there's still a Night's Watch, but holy fuck, where did all these ships come from? These are all black sails, and I'm seeing black cloaks all over them, so is this a Night's Watch navy? What? Is this a real scene I'm watching? Or did the Unsullied adopt plain black for themselves as well? Where did the Unsullied get a navy? But John gets on one at the end of this, so where did the Night's Watch get a navy? Where am I? Grey Worm is gracious enough to leave the jetpack behind as he departs Westeros. And then John walks past a bunch of Dothraki who don't even give him the stink eye? Who wrote this? Danny made them all her blood riders. She dies, they kill whoever killed her, then they die. That's the rule. That's the one thing blood riders do. All the Dothraki should want John dead. And what are they doing? Where are they going? Ah, oh, who cares? Fuck it. Let's just send the Unsullied to die a voluntary violent death of the butterfly plague. John farewells his family. Sansa will rule the north from Winterfell. Arya, unskilled navigator that she is, will die a young and pointless death at sea, and Bran will stick around and continue to make weird cryptic comments at passers-by. A king's duty. I'm sorry I wasn't there when you needed me.
I have no idea what John is referring to here, but Bran does, so I guess it's all fine. But my headcanon is that John thinks Bran would have preferred if he was president for the council so he could be made king, but Bran secretly did want to be king and orchestrated the whole thing for exactly that to happen. This pisses John off, so he kind of feels alright that he has to leave. Brienne is now Lord Commander of the Kingsguard, who now wear ravens on their armour instead of stars, instead of crowns, instead of dragons, and don't wear cloaks anymore. Thankfully, the White Sword Tower made it unscathed through Danny's remodelling. That or the Mender Bug dropped in to fix things up while we weren't looking. It's weird that, judging by the handwriting, Barristan wrote the beginning of his own white book entry. Also weird that Jamie, in spite of his dyslexia and lack of dominant hand, wrote in his own entry. Might have... Might have dictated that, actually. I'm sorry, took River Run without loss of life? Are you kidding? We found the blackfish, my lord. Good. Bring him to me. He died fighting, my lord. Brienne, don't close it! The ink isn't dry yet! What the fuck? Tyrion sets the table in an awkward comedic scene that's supposed to make me forget how insane it is that any of this is happening. He actually did it. He got through the whole second half of the show without facing any consequences. The utter madman. The small council arrives and... Oh no. Oh no 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 no. Grand Maester Sam? Fuck yourself, he dropped out after one semester. He even has a chain! This is insulting! Not as insulting as the book though. I helped him with the title. Well you're pretty awful at titles then, aren't you? Why call it that? Literally any of the individual book titles would have been better than this. Ice and Fire was hardly even the subject of the final chapter of this story, let alone the whole thing since Robert's death, and Tyrion not being mentioned in it. Sure it's a season 2 callback, but that doesn't mean it's not the stupidest thing I've ever heard. The man was Hand of Two Monarchs, killed the most powerful person in the kingdom, is believed to have committed regicide, and he tricked the queen into eating his own jizz. I haven't read every history book, but I reckon I reckon most people with that kind of track record at least make it into a margin somewhere. The king arrives and we learn the tragic fate of Pod the Rod God. Celibacy. Until now I've been against this sort of thing, but celibacy for Pod is making me consider signing that petition to rewrite season 8. I'm sure someone will have linked in the comments below. We've also got Dave on the Council of Master of Ships, which adds up. He's been on a couple of ships, he can be the realm's Grand Admiral. And we've got Bronn as Master of Coin, which is like putting the Hamburglar in charge of the hamburger supplies. The Hunt's done nothing this season, but he's been raised from well-off freelance to the Lord of Highgarden, Master of Coin, and Lord Paramount of the Manda. Sorry, Paramount of the Reach, because I guess we're being plain silly today. He's now the most powerful person in the country. This really devalues the work of Littlefinger, who took decades of scheming to get to a similar position. Bronn drunkenly stumbled into it in less than a year. Anyway, Bran thinks they'll need a new Master of Whisperers. Why? You're omniscient! The, the fuck? Master of Law adds up, maybe big. Big E will settle for that, and I guess we'll need a Master of War to get rid of all the Dothraki and fend off the Iron Bank and stave off the impending invasion from a disgruntled Daria and a Harris. Too bad all the competent military commanders are either dead or exiled. Bran's interested in Drogon though, so he fucks off to find him so we can all shut up about how he never walled a dragon. We serve at your pleasure, King Bran the Broken. Yeah, nah, just Bran works fine, thanks. The Archmaester. THE Archmaester? There's more than one, you fuckwit. You would have known that if you hadn't dropped out. The final line spoken in Game of Thrones is Tyrion tells telling the jackass honeycomb brothel joke, but the scene ends before we hear the punchline as usual. I'm not at all mad that we don't get to hear the ending of the joke, I've known it for years, but really the emotion I'm feeling here is an intense sense of irony, because I could not, in a hundred years, think of a more apt way to describe the eighth season of Game of Thrones than someone repeating a joke you've heard before and not giving you the punchline. One blast for rangers returning. Aya prepares for a voyage, Sansa is crowned queen in the north, and Jon departs from Castle Black to become a lumberjack in the Pacific Northwest. Is he Lord Commander again, or are they just respecting him because he's Jon got dang snow and he's got a good boy that needs a pat? I'm skeptical of how similar this is to their reunion in Season 4, but I'm not going to make any definitive claims other than THIS WAS ADDED IN AFTER THE OUTCRY FROM EPISODE 4, IT WAS MADE IN LESS THAN TWO WEEKS! What the fuck is this crown they gave Sansa? I know Show Rob never had a crown, but shouldn't you be trying to steer into a northern identity? Entity anyway. Where's the iron and bronze? The first men ruins? What is this wavy, fancy ass southern shit? Queen of the North! Yeah, this feels nothing like The King of the North! The King of the North! Because really all she had to do to get here was say, yeah, nah, we'll be independent thanks at some big dumb meeting. I'd love to know how Arya convinced all these people to die at sea with her. I hope this is explored in a sequel series. Yes, 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 it's much like the first episode, very well done, but what the fuck is going on? There's grass? Uh? No thanks. Did the prophesied longest winter in forever really only last a year and a half? What the fuck? And Jon is free to dick about in the snow for the rest of his life. Good for him. And I'm free to complain about this season in its entirety for the rest of my life. Good for me.
Could you imagine if, on the 18th of May 2019, I told you that the finale to Game of Thrones you were about to watch, the last episode of this show, this show, the ultimate conclusion to this show, saw the death of only one named character? You would have laughed in my fucking face, and rightfully so. There was no surprise in this episode, only confusion. I wasn't thrilled, I was lost. How does it feel to have lived long enough to see all of your favorite franchises go down in flames? Feels great. I've been thinking a lot recently about why I became obsessed with this show, and I'm pretty sure it's because the story was like a puzzle that you try to solve as it unravels itself. Sure, you probably didn't get the right answer, but when you got it wrong, you thought, ah, oh, yeah, shit, that makes sense, cool, go on with your story, instead of, well, that was dumb. God, this episode is bland. I was told bittersweet, but this ending is so happy. The only character who I can truly say got a bittersweet ending was Grey Worm, venturing to the idyllic paradise you dreamt of with your lover except now instead of her you only bring her memory. That's bittersweet. Sailing off on an exciting new voyage with your past accomplishments and the reverence of entire kingdoms at your back? That's just happy. Arya Stark, Death's emissary, should not be getting a happy ending. If you think this has a happy ending, you haven't been paying attention. Oh, I'm sorry, Ramsay. You're wrong. Everything turned out great. Oh, I see. Then everything is wrapped up in a neat little package. John kept his head after everything he's done, as does Tyrion, who also gets a sweet pay rise. Sansa got everything she wanted, Brienne gets raised to the highest possible position a knight can hold, Gendry is just happy to be invited, Bran is stuck taking care of everyone's shit, but he doesn't have feelings anyway, so it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Nothing mattered. Targaryen parentage didn't matter. Warging powers didn't matter. Spooky ice demons didn't matter. Blood riders didn't matter. Gilly didn't matter. Nothing mattered. Best season ever! It's better than! I'm not done bitching about this season. Oh, no, no, no. Far from it. Much as I have tried to remove it, there is still evidence online of how long I am willing to beat a dead horse. So fucking subscribe if you want to hear more pissing and moaning on how disappointed we all are that what could have been the actual best show ever ended in such a fucking train wreck. I also talk about other shit sometimes. Check out the back catalogue. My theory videos are a million times better than this. My layers a million times nicer than this. Oh yeah, and thanks Papa Shifty for the shout out and thanks everyone for coming on over from there. That was nuts. You're all real bros. I was unsure if I wanted to do season 8 videos at all, but I took the plunge and now the channel is six times bigger than it was before the premiere. So thanks, it's been wild. Wait, what the fuck happened to weekly videos?